But as I was contemplating this passage, I was thinking about how important for a structure to have a foundation. The foundation of a building is key for the structure. If it's not done right, the building will fall. And you can tell a lot about a building and where it's being built by how it's built. Like the, the foundations on Maine in this freezing cold weather we have here would be not like the, the foundations you need in California because in California you have to deal with earthquakes. They're different. Uh, the deeper a foundation is, the taller the building is. And the more you study a foundation, you realize you can learn a lot about a structure depending on the foundation. Uh, recently, this year, I got to saw, I found a VHS video, I think it was Andy Sperm and Gibney, of this church being moved here. And I got to see them prep it over there and lift it up. I saw the video show them prepping the ground and making the foundation to, to have uh, and concrete it. And it, I saw them move that building here and put it down and they added that front section and added that section. And it was a really neat process. And the reason you guys did it all the way those years is so you could be a do ministry here and reach out to your community. And it said something about where your foundation was. However, what I want you to understand, the foundation you built here for this church is not the real foundation to this church. And in fact, often when we think about the church, we think about a church building, but the real church is not a physical building, it is a spiritual building. It's built on something much better than this building. This building is a place where we do worship service, ministry, but the church is not the building. And so today, as we look at our, continue our serving, uh, our uh, series in 1 Peter, standing firm in grace, we'll go through our next message is the living house of God. The living house of God from 1 Peter 2, 4 through 10. And so we're going to look at three things. First, a spiritual house. What is a spiritual house? A cornerstone. What is the key cornerstone for the church? And a chosen people. A spiritual house, a cornerstone, and a chosen people. So let's look at this first one in a, a spiritual house. Start on verse 4, and we're just going to look at verse 4 first here. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice, precious in the sight of God. Again, Peter is again, keeps on hinting back. He starts with the word and. Of course, we need to remember what he was talking about before, which he was talking about. The, the milk of the word of God, how we should desire the milk of God, and how that helps us grow into spiritual maturity. And then the purpose of that is to where it goes to here, coming to him. The point of the word is to come to him, and who is the him? Well, of course, that's Jesus Christ. The whole point of the scripture, the whole say, say, grow mature, is to point us to Christ. And, the, and it uses this interesting phrase, a living stone. That's an interesting way to quote Jesus as a living stone. He's not like the dead stones of the Jewish religious leaders of his time. They were dead in their works. They were dead in their religious activities. They, 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 their heart was dead to God. And unlike those dead stones of the dead temple, you have Jesus Christ, the living stone that brings life. And so he set up a contrast. He said, Peter, in this text, is going to do a lot of contrasting between two different people. In fact, there's only, when Christianity comes around, there's only two peoples, the people of God and unbelievers. The people of God and unbelievers. And here we're going to see Peter contrast them so greatly. Now he said, then he goes on to appear as a Jesus was rejected by men. 
Knowing this is an interesting term, reject it, because the word reject it would be he is a term like they examine something, maybe a stone, maybe a diamond, see if the diamond ring is real or not, or see if the gold was a good quality, or maybe you're looking at the, your, the used car, see if it's a good used car. They examined it, they tested Jesus, and the religious leader rejected it. And why did they reject it? They rejected it because they had a preconceived idea of what the Messiah is. And beloved, we often can put God in a box and we put the Messiah in a box. We want God to be like how we want to be. But like the Jews here, God doesn't fit into our understanding the, the, what God looks like is what Scripture tells us, which is what he was talking about. God is what Scripture reveals, not what we want. And what did the Jews want? They want a conquering Messiah. They want a Messiah that wasn't going to talk to them about their sin. They want a Messiah that was going to reunite Israel. They, did, they want a Messiah that would throw out all those sinners out of the temple. They just want a, a Messiah that focused on the ruling class. But Jesus threw all that off. He was all about saving the sinner. He was all about justice and mercy and grace. And he was a suffering Messiah, not a conquering Messiah. There would be one day when he would be a conquering Messiah, but it would not be then. And so when he showed up and he was not the Messiah they wanted, he became the stone they rejected. Now, However, that's not how God, the Father, describes Jesus. He describes Jesus as a choice. It's the same word where we get the word elected or chosen. He was elected. God said, this is my man. Not only that, but he's precious because he is the son of God. His blood is precious because he came down from the heaven. The second member of Holy Trinity and came down, he is most precious precious and chosen he is god's son and when you read that those verses it makes you think of matthew 3 17 at his uh, baptism and matthew 17 5 at the the transfiguration where both time god declares to those followers of jesus this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we see the honor and praise and he is his elected chosen person. So though the world rejects him, God says, he is my man. And the reason they reject Jesus is because they did not see the ultimate value in Jesus. Why is it so unsaved world reject Jesus because they don't see their need for Jesus because the world thinks I'm okay I'm not a sinner I'm not messed up and you keep telling me I'm a sinner and that I'm I, I, tell me about the wrath of God and they, I don't want to hear that they want to say no I am healthy Mary the religious leaders often said no I am healthy but Jesus said I came for the sick and a sinner. And if you think you are healthy, you have no part with me. And so they rejected him because they didn't see their need for him. But it reminds you of the one woman at the, the, the table. Remember, she, she wept and cleansed his feet. And the, the, the religious leader rebuked her. And, 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 and Jesus says, she does this because she, those who have been forgiven much love much. The only people who realize they need Jesus is they realize how much they've been forgiven. But the religious leaders and the people of our world, they reject Christ because they don't see any value or need for him because they don't see they are sinners, that they are sick, that they have this cancer called sin, and they don't realize that they are sick. They need a help. They need a doctor. They need Jesus. If they realized who he was, they would see how precious he was. Now, as you go on to verse 5, it then says, You also, as a living stone, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, here Peter 
does something interesting. We see that the gospel transforms us. That we not only are we being forgiven, but we were once those dead stones like the religious leaders. But like Christ, we're being transformed from dead stones into a living stones that changes who we are. As Romans 8.29 would say, you're being conformed to the image of the Son, of Jesus. And as John 3.16, that you have received eternal life. And so you are being transformed into a living stone. But it's not just a living stone, it's a living stone for a purpose. It talks about built up as a spiritual house. Now, when we think of spiritual house, we think of our nice, quaint little house. But back then, a spiritual house was the temple of some divine being, as you, we, we talked about. In fact, God said, will you be a, build a house for me? And, and it informed to the temple of Jerusalem that one day would be, was going to be out. You know, and even the house of Zeus or house of Athena, the temples are often called houses. And he said, you are being built into a temple. You, how amazing is that? God is building us into a temple. That we would come together and worship God. And, and, and I want you to understand that temple, what makes something a temple? Is a place where we worship God. But it's not the building. It's the people. The people, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship God. In fact, the temple is also where God's spirit dwells. Well, God's spirit dwells no longer in the temple in Jerusalem, not that it's there anymore, but remember at the day of his crucifixion, the, uh, the curtain was torn and now we have direct access to God. We have access to the temple, because when we accept Jesus Christ as Savior, we receive the Holy Spirit, and He indwells in us. And that's why we are the temple of God. Not only are we a, a temple of God, and that means, uh, and we do, and we are a temple of God for God's glory and for His purpose, but also we are holy priesthood. Now, priesthood, first of all, as, as, Mar, oh no, as Dennis was saying, we have access to God. 24-7. And we no longer have to go through a priest. We no longer have to offer our sacrifices to get to God. In fact, in the Old Testament time, only the high priest would enter in the holies of holies at the end of the year, at the Day of Atonement. And there was only one time a year when they would enter it. And that was as close as you get. The, and if you're a priest, you might be in the, the main temple area, but the rest of us all, we're even further out. We can never get close to God. But now you are a temple of God, and now you are a priest, and you have access to God. And this is a mind-boggling thing, and we, we often forget. We're so used to being having access to God, we, are, we're, we don't realize how amazing it is that God would want to listen to me. Like I have anything of value to say. But we do. He listens to us. He cares. But not only are we a priest, but we are, to, we are to be holy, a holy priesthood. In other words, we're sanctified. We're set apart. We're not to be of the world, but of Christ. We've been transformed. And so we're holy priesthood to separate from the world, to give glory to God. But what do a priesthood do? As one of the songs we were singing earlier today, Mark did a wonderful job. We were to offer spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God. Now, when you hear sacrifices, you're thinking, well, does that mean we've got to set up an altar in the parking lot and we've got to get some cattle and put it out there? We need to start offering sacrifice for sin offering? No. Might make a good barbecue, but no. But... The sacrifices are different. The sacrifices, and I was reading through John MacArthur's commentary, and he gave uh, five, no, six, sorry, six good ways we give sacrifices up to God. 
The first one is you use your heart, mind, soul. You know, your whole being, your whole body, you use your body, mind, heart, spirit to give worship to God. You use your body. Your body is a living sacrifice to God. Number two, we offer praise and worship to God. As Mark often leads us in our praise time and sing songs and praise and, and, and prayers as Dennis lives in prayer and now we're, we're in s- preaching God's word. This we're giving praise to God for his word, for his truth. And often that's why I love and in the service what worship songs because we turn, we listen to God's word, we can hear God's word, now we're going to give praise to God for his word. And we are to give praise. That is our offering of sacrifice. Another sacrifice is sharing with others, especially in the local church your, and your community to those in need. We are to share with others. And there, God has blessed you with things that you have, and you use what you have to be a blessing to others. God didn't give you stuff to keep it for yourself, but use it to the ministry of God. Fifth, God, you can do the spiritual sacrifice of preaching the gospel to the lost. We are to preach God's word to the lost. There's people who need to hear the gospel, and we can give them the gospel. And six, and finally for right now, going to God in prayer is a form of worship. And so these are just a few things about prayer, a worship, a sacrifice we give to God. There's many orders, but this gives you an idea. But before we uh, move on, I want you to understand, for something to be a temple, for there to be a priesthood, there need to be a gathering of people. I mean, if you have a temple of one stone, it doesn't do too much. If you have one person who is a minister or a pastor, but you have no congregation, it doesn't do that much. A, a, a temple or the church is a gathering of people, and we are to gather In other words, there is no lone wolf Christians. In fact, as we read through this passage, you see this is a covenant community of believers. We are a covenant community, and we are to, and that's why we celebrate communion, and that's why we spend time. We are supposed to have community, because as we talked about earlier in First Peter, we are to be the family of God, the love of each other as brothers, and sisters in Christ. And, and so the temple of God only works if the temple of God is meeting. If we don't meet, there's not much to that temple of God. And so it's not the building that matters, it's the gathering of believers that matter. And the more, the frequent, the better. Let's move on to the next point in the, the cornerstone. The cornerstone. The cornerstone. The cornerstone. First Peter two six through eight. We'll just look at first uh, verse six first. Therefore, this contains the scripture: Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone. He who believes upon me, him will not be put to shame. Here, Peter is quoting. Isaiah 28, 16, where God is talking about the judgment of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim should have been faithful to Israel because it was a cousin of Israel. But instead, they had chosen to rebel against Israel, rebel against God. And so he talks about, again, this choice stone, this precious cornerstone. And if you know anything about masonry or flooring, there's always that key piece, the cornerstone. And, or, or if you've done any tiling. I, I, I spent one summer where I would tile with my dad, and we always have started, what would be our corner tile? And so you start with your corner tile, and that's key because from there on, all the other tiles or cornerstones or flooring is match to that piece. That piece is essential. And if you compare that piece to another piece there, if that piece is out of line, you use the cornerstone or the corner tile 
to see if it's straight. That cornerstone is needed. And if it's a building, it's even more important because it's not only for the foundation and the ground, but it goes up for the walls. That cornerstone is essential. And the cornerstone tells you, are you online? It's like the, the plumb line. It's like the, the level. It tells you, is things straight? Is things level? Does it match up? And here, God takes his level, his cornerstone, to Ephraim and says, you don't line up. Now here, for, uh, Peter brings it up, and he says, he who believes upon him will not be put to shame. In other words, unlike Ephraim, if you line up with that cornerstone, then you have nothing to worry about. In fact, as you read through the passage, Isaiah 28, 16, he tells you Ephraim will be judged, but then he says, I will be faithful to Israel. And to, to that degree, God was the cornerstone, and he was faithful to Israel, and that he was shown to be true, to be measured, to be straight. And if we are trust in God, the cornerstone, Jesus, then we will not be put to shame because he's sure and faithful and true. Then moving on to verse 7, he then says this. He says, the precious value then is, it, is for you who believe, but for those who display the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Now here we have switched. Verse 6, verse 6, was talking about those who are faithful, the believers. And now he switches from the believers to the unbelievers. And to some degree, it's just, which one are you? Are you the believers or unbelievers? And if you're the believers, you have a faithful, trusted cornerstone. And the question is, well, what about those ones who reject Jesus? What happens to them? What is going to happen? And, he, and then he brings it up. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. Now here, he's quoted another verse in the Old Testament, and it's Psalm 118.22. 118, verse 22. And in this psalm, it talks about how the nation is attacking Israel, or in Yahweh, and the nations have rejected the cornerstone of God, of Israel. But like the cornerstone, he will be faithful and true to his people and reveal the nations do not measure up to Yahweh and will judge them. God will judge the nations who have rejected him. And he is that cornerstone that will judge everything. Now, the interesting thing is this same psalm Jesus quotes. In fact, Paul quotes it all other places also. But in particular, Matthew 21:42. Mark 12, 10 through 11, and Luke 20, 17. Jesus quotes the same passage, but now instead of talking about the nations, he points to the religious leaders, the Jewish religious leaders, and say, you have rejected me. You have gone against God. You have rebelled against the Messiah, and you, will be, uh, you have rejected me, and now you will suffer. You will stumble over that cornerstone. And so now he's, he's, he's going to move into another quote from the Old Testament. And it says, and the stone of the stumbling, oops, verse 8, and the stone of the stumbling and the rock of offense. Jesus is that stumbling block, as we've talked about, the rock of offense. Because the gospel says you are a sinner in need of a Savior, that you are not a good person, that you are rebellious against God. It says that you cannot do good enough works. You can't earn or merit salvation. And therefore, unless God acts, you will suffer the wrath of God and go to hell. But that's why Jesus is essential. He is the only way to be redeemed, to be restored, to put your faith and trust in him. But the world doesn't want Jesus' help. They don't want Jesus is reaching down to help them out, and they reject his hand and says, nope, I want to do it myself. And they stumble over the stumbling stone, even though Jesus is reaching down to them. They're stumbling over the stone of their salvation instead of standing on that stone of salvation that could give them life.
but they reject it. Now the next part of this verse, well, I'll slowly go through this verse real quick. They stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And what does it mean by disobedient of the word? It means they had the word preached to them. They've heard the gospel. They heard God's word. They heard it. And instead of saying, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It didn't say that. It said, nope, I reject Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I don't want him as my Lord and Savior. And so they were disobedient to the word and rejected the salvation that was offered to them. And then comes this one verse that if we want to, we could talk a lot about. We're going to touch on it. And to this stumbling, they were also appointed. Now, we could talk about this verse, and let me say theologians have been debating this verses like this for over 2,000 years. We're not going to resolve it here. Some would say, as uh, the Calvinists would say, they were predestined before the foundation of the world to, be, to, go, uh, to go to hell for destruction. And the um, Armenians would say, no, there's a free will. And what he's talking about here is, the, the, the pointed to destruction as if you reject Christ, you will go to hell. But whatever it may be, where it was predestined from the foundation of the world or predestined after you reject Christ, whatever the point may be, the point is, apart from the work of God in your life, you will not be saved. That's the important part. Where we're talking about Armenian Calvinism doesn't matter. What matters, do you accept Christ? Do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? That is the important part. We do not have to debate free will or predestination. What we need to answer is, what are you going to do with it? You've heard the message. You've heard God's word. Will you accept the gospel or will you reject it? And that is really the question to draw from that part. Next part, verse 9, a chosen people. A chosen people. But you, this is not one of these verses, if you want to underline it. But you are a chosen family, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God, our own possessions, so that you would may proclaim the excellence of him. First Peter is looking back to the covenant promise to Israel. If we were to look at Exodus 19, 5 through 6, or Deuteronomy 7 through 6, you hear God's promise to the people of God that they would be a chosen people, priesthood, a nation, and his own possession. And now as, and, and that was a role. The, Israel's role was supposed to be, they would start, create the kingdom of God, and that all the nations would go to them, and uh, Israel would say, let us tell you about the God of Israel. He is God. All your gods are fake. And unfortunately, Israel failed. But that's where the church takes up. We are now, here Peter shows, we now take up the torch that Israel failed to do. Now we represent Christ, not replacing Israel, but we have been grafted in. And as we get grafted in, we now get to represent Christ as Israel was supposed to do. And as we grafted in, as Israel was supposed to represent Christ, in fact, we're grafted into the promise of Israel. And now we are to be this chosen family. The chosen family what? Of Jesus Christ, who are his sons and daughters. A royal priesthood. We are the priesthood of God. We are to proclaim the gospel, proclaim the word. A holy nation, which is the kingdom of God, the pe people for God's own possession. We are God forever. We, he will never leave us and never forsake us. There is a new covenant promise, and it's here it is. Here's our promises. Underline it, circle it, memorize it. This is who you are in Christ now. And you will never be the same again. And if we go, as we go into the future, we must bring this with us. Because the world is going to tell you your identity is this or your identity is that. 
and it's, in fact, the world doesn't know what identity is anymore, then they can't figure out what um, boy, girl, whatever. They can't figure out anything. But here, God tells us, this is who we are. And as we walk in the soldiers in a strange and foreign land, we must remember who we are in Christ. And not only does it tell us who we are in Christ, but it tells us what we are to do. There is a purpose. And what is the purpose of the church? The, uh, the people of God is to proclaim the excellence of Jesus Christ. Proclaim his work on the cross to make, go forth and glorify God and make disciples for Jesus Christ. The mission statement of this church, and that has always been the mission of the church, to glorify God and make disciples. All the way going back 2,000 years, that was our goal, that was a purpose, and as this church goes forward, that is still our purpose, to glorify God and make disciples for Jesus Christ. That is our call, that is our purpose, and that is why we gather together, that is why we go out, is for this purpose, uh, this purpose alone. He then goes on and says, Who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light? For you once were not a people, but now you are a people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have Receive mercy, and it is the transforming power of the gospel. We were once enslaved to sin, but now we're alive in Christ. We were once separated from God, but now we are now we are part of the people of God. We call God our Father and Jesus our brother. And we have the Holy Spirit in dwellings. We are being radically transformed like a caterpillar to a butterfly. We are not who we once were. We once were under God's wrath of sin, but now we see the grace and mercy and, and righteousness of Christ. Beloved, one of the ways we will, we will be able to stand firm in the grace of God is realizing that we are a new identity in Jesus. That we have a new citizenship in Jesus. You are new citizenship, and do I love the United States? This isn't your home. Your citizenship is in heaven, in the kingdom of God. That is your citizenship. And we live in the light of that truth, of that citizenship in heaven. Now, while we're here, we try to have as much of a positive impact as we can, but never forgetting our eyes are on heaven and God's kingdom. Now that we have been called out from this world, so we can be the light of the world. Are you the light of the world and the light of your community, the light in your home? God has called you to be a light, salt and light in the world. To be something that proclaims the gospel and is a redemptive influence in our community. However, beloved, the only way this will be made possible is by working together. The church or individual, the pastor... The elders, the trustees, we cannot do it alone. You notice when we t as we look through this, it is all a covenant community of believers, a chosen family, right? A royal priesthood. The priesthood is not just the pastor. All of us are priesthoods of, in God's sense. We are a holy nation. We are people of God. In other words, we cannot do church if People, want, you're just doing church all by yourself over there, or you're spread out, or you're not committed to the church. Community, a church, that for us to represent Christ, for us to be salt and light in the world, means we need to work together and strive together to bring forth God's kingdom. Because guess what? You all have gifts and talents that I don't have. And you don't, and some of you guys don't have. And if we lose a member... We don't have those gifts. We don't have those talents. We're missing something. It's like when someone leaves the church, it's like we lose the finger or arm or leg. And, and you just think about Dawn Hunt. I've been thinking about her. I always think about her. She's no longer there to play the, the, the organ. And it feels like there's something missing. When we lose a member and if... People are just doing lone wolf Christianity. You aren't just 
doing stuff by yourself. One, you're not being the church. But two, the church hurts when we lose members. And so we all must be engaged and working together as a family, as a church. And the only way that helps us do that is remember our foundation. Not the building, but Christ. He is our cornerstone. And whenever we get lost, whenever we say, what should we do? What would God, what, should we do this? Should we do this? We say, okay, what would Jesus tell us to do? He is that cornerstone to say, are we going straight or are we going crooked? And to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus as we build up the kingdom of God in Dexter, Maine. I want to leave with a couple things here. So the first one is, may we be the living house of God, a living house, a dying house, not a eh house, but a living house, vibrant, moving forward, working together to proclaim the gospel to a world in need, because they need to hear it. We must be active, we must be proactive. They need to hear the gospel. And we have to do it together. Oh, and there's one more there. Oh, I won't worry about it. The, the other one is, may we glorify God and make disciples for Jesus Christ. Now, I can't imagine this has been a more perfectly timed message considering we got the quarterly meeting here. And to some degree, as we go through this, I didn't plan it, by the way. Though some of you might think so, I didn't plan it. Uh, it reminds us the point of why we get together is to glorify God. It reminds us what we do to make sure we're straight in there, we stay on the, the cornerstone of Christ. It reminds us that we've been changed and transformed. And so as we go into this quarterly meeting that's coming up, may we remember what Peter talked to us, and that we are a priesthood, a living stone, a temple of God, with the Holy Spirit in us, and that Jesus is always central and most important as we guide and minister to each other and to the community. Let's just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, If you like these videos, please like, share, subscribe, and ring that bell. God bless you, and have a good day.